Hello, I'm Linda Seif from The Layered Onion. Thank you for joining us. We will be listening to our amazing creators talk about their art and mental health. 48 million artists all over the world share this lived experience. The Layered Onion was formed to create a supportive community, allowing the creators to focus on their art, bringing their work from the shadows to receive the recognition and opportunities they deserve. Each podcast will feature an artist who talks about their creations and mental wellness. Art is healing. We hope these discussions will inspire you to appreciate the stories behind the creations and more importantly, inspire your inner creator. Together, we can tackle the stigma surrounding mental health. So hello, Fran. How are you? Hello, Linda. I'm doing all right. Lifing over here. How are you doing? (laughs) I'm doing great. So welcome to the Layered Onion podcast. Um, What I'd love for you to do is go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience. Absolutely. I'm Fran Hong. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I'm born and raised in Madison, Wisconsin, and pretty sure I'm a lifer. I'm a very (laughs) proud daughter of Korean immigrants, and my parents came here from South Korea in the late 80s, so you can calculate how, what my age range is. Um, And I currently serve as the state representative for the 76th Assembly District, representing a good chunk of the Isthmus in Madison, Wisconsin, including the UW um, Northeast and Downtown Madison. And I uh, also am the co-owner of Morris Ramen, a small neighborhood ramen shop tucked away in the King Street neighborhood um, in downtown. Uh, and currently, my most important role, though, is I am a mom to a curious and amazing seven-year-old named George. Um, I also, as I prepared for this, you have so many different roles that you've um, done within the community, working with starting an organization for women who are in food service leadership positions, uh, doing a lot on food insecurity. I just wonder, how do you manage all of this as a parent as well? I mean, owner, representative. I mean, it's a lot. How do you manage all of it? Well, I don't manage it well all the time. (laughs) And I'm I'm fortunate um, and very grateful to work with amazing organizations uh, who allow me to be a part of their space and give input. So I serve on the board uh, of Rooted, which I think is an integral organization to help with both food insecurity, but um, food systems education. Obviously, um, I work a lot with REAP Food Group as well um, and uh, their work uh, to help us uplift an important piece of legislation called Healthy School Meals for All. Um, And then, you know, my work with the Culinary Ladies Collective, that was really born out of one of the most powerful ways to organize, which was women coming together around a table think we had tea and snacks and we talked about what we cared about and how we could share our talents our grit um, and our ways to care for one another uh, to do good and to raise funds for folks like Planned Parenthood the Rape Crisis Center um, Domestic Abuse Intervention Center we've got amazing organizations here in the area um, committed to care and caring for one another. And I think food is ultimately at the center of that um, and those who work in food. And so my mental wellness really comes from being able to make um, connections and foster relationships with people really in the grassroots and at the heart of this work. So let me go back a minute. So what attracted you to be in, uh, become a chef? I mean, obviously you're, you, um, well, you know what? Not obviously. Maybe let's just start with <laughs> what attracted yeah. you to become a chef. <clears throat> so my food journey started with, like so many, um, eating food that my mom made. Uh, and then when she decided to courageously go back to school to become a teacher, um, my sister and I had to start cooking at home and, and learn how to you know, start making some food for ourselves until mom came home. 
And um, I got really interested in cooking, um, you know, watching food shows, Julia Child on PBS and Food Network, um, then started to buy cookbooks and, and read up on um, interesting recipes. Um, you know, we didn't grow up uh, with a lot of Western food, I would say. The cuisine I was most familiar with was what I call Midwestern Korean. So maybe brats and samjang with, um, you know, other panchans or Korean side dishes and a soup and rice. Um, maybe we'd have steak, but instead of it served more Korean barbecue style, um, we just, you know, had it with a little simple salt and pepper, but always had kimchi on the table. Um, and so food was a big part of our family, but I think... Um, it didn't really hit me that I could do it professionally until I started working in restaurants um, when I was 16, um, mostly just part time to be able to help, um, you know, supplement my allowance. Uh, and then in college, it became a way for me to help pay for tuition and at the restaurant called La Brioche, um, there was a time where I was mostly working in front of house as a server. And then um, was invited to help uh, on garmage or work salads and then decided to leave school and leave the front of house to manage brunches and work in the kitchen full time. And then from there, it just became learning as much as I could. It was amazing to me that I could be paid um, to learn and to work with my hands and create dishes um, and really see how the uh, you know i'm i may be over romanticizing a little bit but i think i learned so much about what you know working with a team and working under pressure and you know trusting the people around you to be able to get through brunch service and how important it is that we have that trust if we're going to get through service together so as much as it was important for me to be creating i think ultimately my time training in restaurants was really about um, how to understand people and how to grow my empathy and really build mental stamina um, for how much I could handle. And so that that still, I think, is why I'm serving in a lot of roles today is because um, I built that I built that up working in restaurants. So you talk about your mother being courageous to go back to school, but it must have taken a tremendous amount of courage for you to leave school and pursue um, work in the food service industry. I'm sure that there might have been some concern by your folks at making that switch. Tell me kind of about that moment and the courage it took. Well, um, I think I'm going to back us up to my senior year of high school. Um, I didn't actually walk at graduation because um, after the first semester, I had pretty traumatic um, mental health breakdown and was hospitalized for a week in um, children's psychiatric units. And so I think that was kind of the first moment where my parents and our family realized that I may not be on the trajectory that I was working towards and that they were hoping I was working towards. Um, I did a little bit of traveling um, after a short stint at McAllister College um, and I was trying to get through school, um, but it, you know, it wasn't a place where I felt like I belonged. And so while I was working in restaurants and trying to go to school, I think when I told them that I wanted to just work in restaurants and put school on pause again, I didn't tell them I was leaving forever, but that I was putting school on pause because finding a sense of belonging was really important to me. And I felt that working in restaurants, I was, you know, it was the first time that I met someone from another part of the state who I got to become close with. I remember my friend Jamie Land was from the UP and there were people who were mostly older than me. There were folks who were the same age as me, people from all different backgrounds. And that's where I felt this sense of belonging, not necessarily at a more structured institution like UW was. So I, you know, that conversation was difficult, but I think um, after I was diagnosed, I um, while I was in the hospital, I was diagnosed with manic depression, um, and you know, they they realized that um, my work to like my mental health journey was ultimately going to 
be better if I could figure out where I felt like I belonged and I was doing something that was meaningful. And so I think they were more understanding to that because of where I was uh, on my mental health journey. And, but it was still, I think if you ask them, um, they were pretty shocked and probably a little sad and, but they knew and they trusted me to make um, the best decision for me at that time. So as you reflect back on that and think about moving forward and you have um, a young son, it's really, I think, a challenge in kind of the rush, rush environment and also sort of this push, push, push always to hire ed. And I think the food service industry is such a great home for so many people. And I think there's a real disconnect with how it is a career and it's a talent to be in the food service industry. And there's just this huge disconnect. How do you think we could do a better job of really making people aware? I think first and foremost, uh, the folks who have a platform or are in the leadership positions have a responsibility to destigmatize um, the mental health challenges that many in the industry face. We have to talk about it. We have to name it. We have to name things like suicide ideation, uh, post-traumatic stress, you know, manic depression, bipolar, whatever you want to call it. We, we have to be specific in the language that we use, but also compassionate about the feelings that and the triggers that it might cause to folks. And, and that's really difficult to do, but it will always start with a conversation and folks with a platform and a leadership position to hold themselves accountable and be responsible to foster those conversations. Um, when we first start, like I would say, Maybe 2019, um, we had heard about uh, restaurants in Milwaukee and Chicago starting to host, you know, uh, peer groups where folks could, um, who may, uh, who weren't ready to maybe go to a more um, structured setting like um, AA or, uh, I'm uh, blanking on some of the other amazing groups that do peer support work, but what it would be like to have a peer support group for folks just in the industry. So there's this um, solidarity and, and mutual understanding of some of the hardships we go through, the pressures we face, the lack of benefits, um, you know, beyond just kind of the systemic inequities in the restaurant industry, but just, you know, how easy it is to um, really fall into some dangerous uh, behaviors and habits. Um, and so I think so much of it starts with that at that leadership level, fostering those conversations, um, but also, you know, for, for us to hold spaces um, where people feel like they can be brave and talk about what's going on. So I have been so amazed at the um, synergies between the layered onion and um, the Dane County Food Collective and probably just the food service industry because they're super creative people who have um, mental health challenges and there's a huge overlap. And I, I've i just been um, really uh, hopeful as I see like when I was looking through um, your menu, Morris Robbins menu, the huge amount of non-alcoholic um, mocktails that were present. And do you see that that's kind of a switch to help with the mental health and some of the substance abuse, et cetera, this, this movement by the, by the industry? Absolutely. And I think there's also, um, you know, there, there has to be an economic motivation as well and a benefit for the restaurant owner um, to, and they, people are finally recognizing that when we are more inclusive of diverse consumer needs, we are going to see those benefits on our bottom line. Um, not only is it healthier for our staff and can put just less pressure on folks to feel like they have to have a drink um, for a team builder, as we call it. We used to do shots at the end of the night and we called it team building. And I realized just how difficult that could be for somebody um, who was sober. And as we um, tried to, and we took 
input from folks directly who were um, sober or on a sober journey um, about how we could make the space more inclusive um, to them. And I think that seeing this trend in more um, alcohol-free uh, beverage, beverage lists, um, there's a restaurant or a bar in, uh, there's sober bars popping up in Milwaukee. Uh, I think that it's, it's a great first step in fostering more full sober spaces and as well as those conversations we need to have about um you know how we can overcome alcohol abuse in our industry yes i've as i've talked to uh, different chefs and um folks in the food service industry i don't know that i quite understood how deep-seated the alcohol piece was. And as you talked about doing shots at the end of night, the night, I heard a pretty, I have heard from others about how it just was the reward at the mm -hmm. end. You make it through the shift and then you were going to get this drink. And, um, you know, for those that aren't at the end of a, a restaurant close, we were totally unaware of of that and yet it makes some sense right because that's you know a big part of um probably revenue and others is having the beverage menu right and i think there's this also feeling that if you're doing a mocktail people would not pay the same as they would if there was a, an alcohol in it and i so i think it's really switching a whole mindset do you see a change with the younger folks I do, and I think that's where we have to be more intentional and expansive it's on campus, especially. I will hear from student constituents uh, the pressure they feel to drink as if that is the only and most important social space to be a part of. You know, you mentioned that, uh, you know, it can feel like we're using alcohol as a, a way to celebrate or reward ourselves after a difficult or busy service. And I think, you know, we really have to shift that mindset. And I think that's happening, um, that there are so many other things, including camaraderie to gain from being in the restaurant industry. Um, to be amongst artists and folks uh, who rely on the industry to help them support other passions that they have, to be around folks uh, who do see this as a career, but other folks who may be, um, you know, doing this temporarily to help them support, to help support them for school. I think that for a younger generation, um, there is a much more conscious effort to focus on mental health wellness, and that wellness includes limiting alcohol or being sober. And so um, being intentional that this is uh, available to young people, absolutely. Um, but I also think it's important to keep uh, utilizing sober spaces um, and, uh, you know, longer or uh, alcohol-free menus um, to foster camaraderie among staff as well, because they're the ones who's going to tell other members of their sober community or friends who are also on that journey to say, hey, this is another space where we can go and enjoy this. Um, and we can feel like it's as worth and, and value as worthwhile and valuable as um, a cocktail menu. Um, and you can tell because they're using, you know, fresh syrups and tonics and um, other things that, uh, you know, herbs and whatnot um, that mixologists use. Um, and they're putting that effort into a non-alcoholic beverage as well. And so it's it's about seeing them as, as just as valuable and also recognizing um, where folks are at in that sober journey or being um, more limiting with alcohol and respecting those choices as well. So I want to turn a minute to how you chose to have it be a ramen um, restaurant and the path that you got from being an executive chef to owning your own restaurant. So um, a lot had to do with um, my marriage and I married a sushi chef, um, Matt Morris, back in 2012. I was working as the executive chef of 43 North Restaurant at that time. 
I had to leave because of severe burnout. Um, and he continued to work for uh, Shinji Muramoto, who um, is one of the owners of uh, restaurant or former owner of restaurant owner Muramoto and Sushi Muramoto uh, here in Madison. And, you know, he, with, you know, how loyal and how well um, Matt was leading his team uh, at the sushi restaurant, um, he asked us if we wanted to partner with him to open a ramen restaurant. And it hadn't really occurred to me, but then I started researching ramen more. My, hus my then husband and I um, went to Japan. He was on a sabbatical uh, cooking in northern Japan at a small isekaya restaurant or omikaze restaurant. Um, and I was doing ramen research. And right away, I felt this kinship um, because ramen is really the soul food of Japan. It um, takes tremendous technique and a lot of love and a lot of passion uh, to create a broth. And um, the, the, I think the accessibility of ramen, you know, and how diverse of a clientele and a uh, you know, all different types of people around the world enjoy it. Um, it made sense for me because I've always wanted a restaurant that fosters community and has that neighborhood restaurant feel um, where people feel a sense of comfort too. And ramen is a food that does that. So now you've, you've launched this restaurant and you're getting to, and you launched the restaurant in 2016? No. Correct. It's the yes. same son. <laughs> I always remember 2016. <laughs> so you're a new parent. You've launched a restaurant. And how, how have you tried to maintain your mental wellness through all this? A lot of it is taking small pockets of the day to literally do things like look up at the sky, um, to do breathing exercises. Um, I try to get in a small workout or some sort of exercise every day, but the majority is in taking care of the relationships that I'm in and um, relying on people to, um, family and close friends to help me feel less alone. I think, um, Politicians don't often talk about how isolating this work is. Um, people in, you know, higher leadership positions, it feels like we can't talk about um, the loneliness in our jobs uh, because of the immense privilege that comes with our jobs. Um, and so I think taking immense care and making investments in relationships so that I always know folks are going to be there for me. And then remembering that I'm not alone in mental health struggles, going back to why it's so important to talk about it. Um, ultimately, even if you're not ready to partake in a conversation about your mental health, hearing that other people are struggling and knowing you're a part of that collective struggle, which means you'll be a part of a collective healing too, um, gives me a great sense of comfort. So it's about doing some small stuff small things for myself, but ultimately relying on um, a collective and, and people who care about me um, to do the heavy lifting. So I, I think about being open, and I think that it's, it is difficult for anybody to be open, but it, it's probably more difficult as a state representative who has a very public image and public platform what's been the reception of the community to you being really open? Generally, very positive and welcoming. Um, I think there are those who worry. Um, I think people who want to advise me mostly on my political career um, that being vulnerable could be seen as a sign of weakness, but I always preface conversations with vulnerability is powerful. 
because it is one of the best tools for us to be able to connect, see, and value one another. And so, especially when I talk to young folks at high school level or um, when I go to universities, mental health is always an issue they care about and bring up. And so one of my ways to really humanize politics and let them know that I am someone that is willing um, to see them is, is I have to be first to let them see me. And so I'll talk about my time um, at uh, Meritor Psychiatric. I'll talk about difficult uh how difficult it was for me to link up with a therapist that, um, you know, I was able to feel in, in community with and connect with. Um, and I'll talk about how our mental health struggles are part of systemic problems that we have and how we have, we, uh, prioritize individual needs over the collective and how we don't often center the most vulnerable or marginalized and how we craft policy that a lot of the times government work is um, not uh, is not biased for us. Um, and we've got people shaping narratives, but the most powerful way to change that narrative is to speak truth to your power and to recognize that um, Connecting with one another about our vulnerabilities is how we're going to shift the narrative and see it better as um, something more powerful. So the response is sometimes mixed, but generally very receptive and welcome because people see it as a way to connect with me. And it's incredibly powerful for me because I'm able to better develop relationships with my constituents, better understand needs of the community. And again, I think we can't see politicians as, you know, this, it's important to change the culture around politics. And the best way for us to do that is to humanize one another. And I often think, being in your shoes, it might be a little difficult to maintain hope with your colleagues um, because it it seems like you move um, an inch forward and go back two. And so is that a particular challenge or is that just part of the whole same dynamic? I think hope comes from trust. And I I think a lot of mistakes that politicians make is that we underestimate voters and we don't focus on building trust with communities. And so I trust the work that's happening in our communities. I mentioned some amazing organizations earlier in the in the conversation, but you know, organizations like that are all around Wisconsin. And when politicians and leadership have failed communities, and I would say for the last 12 years, the majority party have absolutely failed communities, people are resilient and come together. We saw that during the height of COVID too. So I trust community leaders and people to help politicians better understand what their needs are. Um, and our ability to organize, we were able to have a tremendous outcome that helped us shift the um, makeup of our state Supreme Court, which gives us a pathway to actually have representation with fair maps in Wisconsin, because we know that these maps are unconstitutional. Um, and so I... I generate hope when I go back into the community and talk to people. I have very little hope when I have conversations with some of my colleagues across the aisle. But then again, when I ask them about the communities that they serve and the relationships that they have in places that are very different from Madison, I get hopeful once again because, you know, I... I I make a very conscientious effort to speak to Republicans on session days where we're all together and have individual conversations with them. Again, going back to needing to value, see, and, and humanize one another. And they will speak very clearly to what their community needs are. It is absurd how they won't vote to help their communities most of the time, but they are aware of what their needs are. And so... I always say I'm, I'm nauseously optimistic, 
and carefully hopeful that uh, Wisconsin is on a pathway to be more representative of people's needs and what they care about. Um, and that uh, as as often as I'm banging my head against the marble in this building, I also know that things are changing. So one thing that I really saw um, stand out is this, and maybe this is why you decided to become a representative, is, is this understanding that ultimately food is inherently political. And that if your basic needs, which include food, shelter, et cetera, aren't met, that that, that just changes everything. Can you kind of tell me about the moment that made you decide to run for the representative of your district? So COVID played a very large role in my decision to run for office. The moment was at home alone. <laughs> uh, you know, Georgie was asleep and I, uh, you know, I felt very hopeless. I felt very much like this is, we're headed towards the end of civilization, like right now. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think it's my awareness to my mental health that actually contributed to, I cannot, um, I, I felt myself going into a darker space and I knew I needed to do something drastic to pull myself out of it. And so in that moment, I reconsidered um, running for office because they say you have to ask a woman six or seven times to run for office before she considers it, which in itself is absurd. But that also speaks to the gross sexism in communities. <laughs> but, um, you know, I had been asked a couple of times because of, you know, rallying and organizing with other small business owners and community members to fight for restaurants. And I think in that moment, feeling very much alone, I selfishly also decided that running for office will help me connect more with community to build hope for myself and my family and my community. And so, and it was my work in food, my understanding of, of food systems and the need to build better policies for it and take care of restaurant workers who were absolutely being left behind uh, during the height of COVID and oftentimes continue to that, you know, made me aware of what being a working person who was struggling, even though I owned the business, I would say most restaurant owners are still struggling. Um, that I that we needed collective change and that that was going to come with better representation of someone who actually knew what it was like to be in the trenches of this. And so knowing that I wasn't going to be alone in running for office, that um, I would be successful if I had a community that I believed in, believe in me too, I think really propelled me to just do it. Well, congratulations. That took a lot of courage. And I think I'm. Uh, uh, that is what I hear a theme for you is courageous. And so you point to your mother, but you're very courageous. So one of the things that I am struck by, and maybe you can give both a, a, a legislative and maybe a historical, is, you know, fair wages. And uh, the greatest example of fair wages that do not happen are for wait staff. Um, how did we ever get to a place where uh, wait staff isn't even paid minimum wage? And um, how do we change the culture around people understanding that the food service industry deserves, uh, uh, you know, a uh, living wage just like everyone else? I think too often and for a long time, we heard the terrible, horrific phrase, um, unskilled or low skill. And the reality is, the truth is, it takes a tremendous amount of skill to be a service industry worker. We are built different. It takes um, multitasking, uh, emotional labor, physical stamina, mental stamina, an ability to 
connect with all different types of people. These are all things that not everyone possesses. Um, and so seeing service industry work and valuing it as much as we value the nine to five job is the first step in ensuring that the workers uh, who are doing this very difficult work um, of service uh, are valued and paid. And there are a lot of different reasons um, why we haven't been able to increase the minimum wage and abolish the tipped minimum wage, which is still two thirty-three an hour um, here in Wisconsin, and our minimum wage is still seven twenty-five an hour. Many of my Republican colleagues will speak to you know the the perils of business owners having to raise labor. Uh, raise wages and and what it's doing to their profits and the reality is they were artificially low for too long and still any bad actor can still um, have most servers or workers um, working those minimum wages so it's about valuing and understanding the vast skills that it takes to be a service industry worker and valuing the work as much as we value other work um, recognizing that you know the where tipping came from um, is rooted in institutional racism um, and what happened uh, after um, uh, uh, slavery was abolished, um, which actually it still isn't in Wisconsin, but that's another story. Um, and how we created class systems to make it seem that some laborers and folks uh, in the working class um, were less deserving than others. And so if we don't see service industry work and value service industry work um, as, as work that takes a great amount of skill, um, it will continue to be undervalued. And the problem, if, if we can, and, and restaurants and service industry are absolutely a microcosm of our greater systemic inequities in our societies. And I think that if we see um, like what's happening in Las Vegas right now with hospital workers um, fighting for unions, better wages, better benefits, um, when we don't have those workers, you're gonna see big parts of um, our communities collapse. And so this, this respect and this valuing of service industry workers is long overdue. And I think that if we value our service industry workers more, um, we'll see better benefits and better wages happen in all of our industries that are undervalued, but really hold up the entire economy. I always feel like I lasted two weeks as a <laughs> server. And I often hope that everybody who didn't make it would reflect on that. Because I did not have the stamina. I had some very um, experiences that really, really were traumatic. And I thought, these folks go through this all the time. And so I have such high value and um, uh, just admiration for people <laughs> because I didn't make it. <laughs> it didn't last very long. So I'm hoping that people, if, if they tried and failed that they would reflect on that and think about it. So, well, unfortunately our time's coming to a close, but I have one question that I really would love to know. If you reflected back to the 12 year old Fran, what advice would you give her that you think would really have been helpful? I think the most helpful advice would be to be gentle with myself. I was really hard on myself and um, still tend to be. And I'm often reminded to give myself grace, um, to be less harsh, <laughs> uh, and um, to remember that if I don't take care of myself, that's what's most uh that will risk a lot of other people's care too and the thing that is most meaningful to me is being able to care for folks whether that it's through a great bowl of ramen or fighting for them here in the capital 
um, or relating to other caregivers and parents about how difficult care work is. I think if we don't take care of ourselves first, it's difficult to take care of the community. So I would tell my 12 year old self to take care of myself a little more. That's good advice. So, well, thank you so much for spending time with us and um, look forward to seeing where your journey takes you and um, both from your restaurant, from your work at the Capitol and your work as a parent, probably the most important work, right? Absolutely. Thank you so much for holding this space, Linda. I had a wonderful time and a great conversation. Thank you for joining us today. It is an honor to talk with these amazing creators. You can see and read the artist's work in The Shallot, our journal of mental health, art, and literature, or on our website, thelairdaonion.com. Thank you. Thank you.